Hi, my name is David Myers, and I am a dependency lawyer who represents parents and children. Hi, my name is Tracy Lee. I'm with County Counsel's Office, and I represent the Child Welfare Agency and Dependency Court. My name is Jennifer McLaren, and I'm also with County Counsel's Office, and I represent the Child Welfare Agency. And if you're being told to watch this, it's because you're about to go into your first detention hearing as a county child welfare worker. So, you filed your petition and your report. It's your expectation that the court will adopt your recommendations and turn them all into court orders. And we'd like that too, um, but that doesn't always happen, and that's a little bit why we're going to talk about today. Um, so Tracy, can, is there something they need to know before we talk about the actual courtroom? You bet. Do you remember that eighth grade civics class, something about checks and balances? You, as a county employee of a child welfare agency, are part of the executive branch, and you are granted certain powers by the legislature. The judicial branch acts as a check on those powers to make sure that you execute in accordance with the law. Before we start talking about the court hearing itself, there's a lot that goes on. So Jen, tell us a little bit about just the people, the players, and a little bit about the what, what's the mood like in the courtroom? So when you're walking into your first detention hearing, you need to be prepared for complete and total chaos. Um, the, the time of the detention hearing is very short, a couple of days from when the removal of the child from the parents' custody happened. And oftentimes the parents are still grappling with the circumstances under which the child was initially removed. Substance abuse, domestic violence, incarceration, whatever. So it's a pleasant place to be, right? <clears throat> it's just, it be prepared for chaos. Um, there's going to be a number of people that are coming out uh, to talk to you. Whether we have a child's attorney, a parent's attorney, your attorney in the form of county counsel, um, you have a bench officer. There's a lot of people in the courtroom and there's a lot of information sharing and everybody's going to be wanting to talk to you because you're the person that has the most information about the case at that time. That's right. Now court hearings are governed by laws. There's federal law, there's state law, there's rules of court, there are local rules. And then, of course, there's your particular county culture, um, which can throw all those other things right out the window sometimes. Um, but the detention hearing is governed by the Welfare Institutions Code, Section 319. And Tracy, can you talk a little bit about what happens when, as everyone is arriving? Sure, Dave. Hmm? So uh, a few minutes, a second ago, uh, Jen was talking about the different players in the courtroom. You have parents' counsel and child's counsel. And they have a role. They have a, an attorney-client relationship. Um, child's counsel, attorney-client confidential relationship with the child, parents' counsel with the parent. And they have an obligation to zealously represent their clients. And part of that will be getting information from you so that they can better be prepared to represent their client's interests, which may be very different than where you think the case should go. Part of the pre-hearing options, what, what's going on in the courtroom is actual negotiation. Before even going on the record, everyone's looked at your report, they're trying to get information from you, and are looking to where they think this, court, this case may go. The court may even give an intended ruling or indicate to the parties in the courtroom, based on the evidence presented that they're seeing before them, where they might see the case going. Also. Because this is such a short period of time and everyone's trying to gather information, there may be a need for a continuance. I want to remind you, this is an odd uh, kind of system in that folks with, with attorneys are talking to each other. That's not normal in civil or criminal law. But this, this um, system can't move forward without that kind of collaboration. Just understand that what you say is never off the record. And it's important to remember that the goal here is child safety and family preservation. So communicating with all of the attorneys and all of the parents and the children is very crucial. Um, so once the case is called and you are on the record, the court, as Dave said, because this is all driven by the law in 319, um, is going to go over specific sections and inquiries. Um, the first one is going to be whether or not you made reasonable efforts to prevent removal, whether there was something else you could have done to protect the child um, without actually physically removing them from their parents. The court's going to ask you if you've explored the possibility of relative placement. Um, hopefully you were able to contact relatives and place the child or the children with relatives prior to the debt hearing, but if not, be prepared to, at, be prepared to answer questions about what efforts you've made. Um, visitation. The court's going to want to know what is your recommendation for visitation with the parents. Is it appropriate to visit? How does that visitation look? Twice a week? Once a week? Daily? What, what is your recommendation? 
Um, educational needs of the child, can the child remain in the school of origin if they are of school age? Um, and how, how does that look? And is the parent still capable and appropriate to make educational decisions for the child? What referrals to services are you intending to make for the parents regarding what their issues are? Parentage, the court's going to want to know who are the parents of the children. If you have a, a mother and she has not identified the father, the court will make that inquiry to the mother at the hearing. The more you can make that inquiry, the better you will be prepared to answer those questions as well. And ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act, the court is required to ask whether or not the child has Native American heritage. So when you're sitting in court, these are the phrases, this is the language, these are going to happen in every single hearing, and the better prepared you are for it, um, the better, the faster and smoother the hearing will go. Um, there is a low burden of proof at this hearing. It's called a prima facie evidence or prima facie standard. I don't think anyone really knows how to pronounce it, um, so we make it up. But it is a low burden. On its face, it's presumed to be true. So um, one of the things that happens sometimes, uh, lawyers don't understand this themselves, and sometimes they will fight and they will contest detention hearings um, without really understanding that the burden of proof is low and that the judge is really going to go your way, um, presume that what you write is true, um, and it's going to take a lot to undo that. Um, and then there are other times where these hearings can be contested. Sometimes it's your county culture. The, you show up at a detention hearing and the judge puts you on the witness stand. Welcome, come testify for me. Um, that happens in certain counties. And um, sometimes judges are fooled. Sometimes judges will, will look down and they will see someone who presents a certain way and it leads them to make a certain decision. Um, sometimes it's, it's the lawyers and sometimes it's, it's the fact that you haven't prepared things that can cause things to be contested. And that's certainly not what we want. And so um, Tracy, can you talk a little bit about things that social workers can do to ensure that the hearing goes really well? You bet. Prepare, prepare, prepare. And I'm going to put a plug in to use your county council. It's really important to understand that they're your guide for what goes on in the courtroom and what evidence may or may not be missing from your report or information that may be useful to um, prevail on your recommendations. Use the supports around you, your coworkers who um, mentors, your supervisor, your specialists or program planners. Understand the reason for the hearing and tell the whole story. Make sure that you're checking your biases as much as you can at the door. You're just trying to be a neutral fact finder and provide the information to the court so that the court can make a fully informed decision. Document, 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 and lastly, I'll say, this is not personal, it's business. Any final thoughts? I think that's good. We hope that this video helps you get through your first attention hearing. Thank you.